Good evening. In 1947, American pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing objects flying in formation at nearly 2,000 miles an hour. The media leapt on two words he used to describe what he saw. Flying saucers. And so began the modern UFO phenomenon. Today there is one small town in America where UFO mania has swept through the local population, sparking off an unprecedented frenzy of reported sightings and bizarre claims. Could hundreds of witnesses be mistaken? Or is there really something out there? The town of Gulf Breeze spends its time basking in the subtropical sun of the Florida panhandle. Separated from the mainland, it wallows in the superheated waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Nothing much used to happen in this small affluent town, apart from the occasional rot of a hurricane. But on November the 11th, 1987, a new storm hit town that would change the lives of some of the residents forever. Well, my thoughts were to catch a picture of it as it went overhead. This strange blue beam came out of it and struck me. And this object was just hovering, it was perfectly still. We're seeing something that we're obviously seeing, but we have no concept of what it is that we're seeing. It's coming towards us, it's getting closer to us. It was a reader's contribution to a local Gulf Breeze newspaper which sparked off a unique phenomenon which would draw in tens of thousands of people. I returned to the office one day and my secretary said that a man had brought in some UFO photographs taken in Gulf Breeze. I looked at them and there were Polaroids and I felt, how do you fake a Polaroid? My folks stopped in the office and I said, you're not going to believe what we're getting ready to run in the paper this week. And they looked at the photographs and they said, where'd you get these photographs? That's what we saw. And it turns out that they saw the same night the same craft. I lost all inhibitions about going big with the story because if you can't trust your mother, who can you trust? The story had a major impact on the town. TV and newspaper reporters flocked to the area to investigate. To report sightings of unidentified flying objects known as UFOs. They weren't the only ones looking into it. Don Ware, a retired colonel in the U.S. Air Force, and Charles Flanagan were sent by MUFON, the international UFO organization, to investigate the origin of the Polaroids. In those photos, there were two key details that was of primary interest to me. One was a an electrical junction box uh, that sets high on, on the pole. And the other was where the photographer had to have been standing behind a cedar tree. The photos have been delivered by a local man, Ed Walters, who said they'd been taken by a neighbor who wanted to remain known only as Mr. X. We were kind of concerned about uh, finding out exactly uh, which neighbor of Ed's uh, was Mr. X and, and where the pictures were taken. We drove streets uh, at all times of the, the day looking for those two key objects. Eventually, after seven or eight days, we found the location. Uh, lo and behold, it turned out to be Ed's front yard. Ed Walters was a well-known man in Gulf Breeze. A pillar of the community, he employed over 200 people in his successful building firm and had a good reputation, something he didn't want to lose. I was concerned the UFO stigma would stick. And uh, certainly, you just don't want to be known as the general contractor who sees UFOs. So when I first uh, went to the newspaper, I said, oh, a friend of mine, you know. But of course, you know, the friend of mine story just never does hold up. With Ed Walters admitting he had taken the Polaroids, the MUFON investigators moved up a gear. Had no idea at all at that point how big this case may, uh, may become. January 7, 1988. But as with all investigations, we must remain skeptical, but with an open mind. Well, John, I believe these are what you came to see. Mr. Walters. You mind telling us how you came to take these photographs? 
or I deal in concrete and steel and real life. And to look out my window at my office at my house and see something unusual didn't necessarily bother me because normally you would explain it away. And I got up from my desk and kind of looked through the window and it's behind the trees. What is that? So I grabbed a camera, a little Polaroid camera I use on job sites. The more time I looked at it, which this was all happening very quickly, the more I realized that this was not something I could explain away. A lot of thoughts went through my mind, and I was, my goodness, could I really be looking at a UFO? This was a very magnificent looking craft, silent, wingless. The UFO turned and started in my direction. My thoughts were to catch a picture of it as it, as it went overhead. This strange blue beam came out of it and struck me. Having said that, you must realize that that sounds bizarre to my ears. So I know that somebody listening to me say I was struck by a blue beam, their eyes have got to roll back in their head and go, oh my goodness, this is true. From the initial meeting with Ed Walters, he was extremely cooperative. I found him to be a very detailed individual and I enjoyed working with him. I would ask uh, Ed the same question two or three times, only I would word it in different ways. And always it came up with the same conclusion. Ed Walters' pictures also attracted the interest of Dr. Bruce Maccabee, an optical physicist with the U.S. Navy. He's worked, among other things, on the Strategic Defense Initiative, or Star Wars project. He spent over 30 years investigating UFO sightings. A lot of time was spent on the first photograph to de determine whether or not it could have been created as a simple double exposure. It seemed to be, a, 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 if not a legitimate photo, if it was a hoax, it was extremely difficult. George Lucas could probably do with the, uh, the strange light company that he uh, runs, but uh, Ed Walters couldn't do with his little Polaroid. But not everyone was impressed. Ed was accused of hoaxing and publicly ridiculed in the press. The story might have ended there until another witness came forward, church elder Art Hufford. They were putting front page headlines about UFO experts declaring Gulf Breeze photographs a hoax uh, and claiming that it was something that uh, somebody had done in a, in a dark room uh, uh, with trick photography. And that made me a little angry because I knew there were there was no trick photography or mirrors on the windshield of my car. Art claimed to have witnessed the same UFO as Ed photographed just a few miles away on the same day. My wife and I had been in town uh, and setting up tables at our church. As we were uh, driving towards our home, uh, suddenly up ahead uh, uh, I saw this craft hovering above trees and I pointed it out to my wife and we, uh, we watched this thing as I drove toward it. It looked like nothing we had ever seen before. Uh, this uh, oval sh crown shaped looking craft had a very bright white light on the top uh, and the base of the craft was emitting a, a bright white light as well. And that's not a helicopter, that's not a plane. And it was just hovering there above trees probably two, maybe three blocks in front of our car. My concept at the time of people who had reported UFO sightings, I always thought that was probably somebody who had who had had too much to drink or something. It became apparent that it was uh, not just uh, an Ed Walters uh, UFO because many, many other witnesses came forward, city council people, ministers, so many people that we felt like it was a whole community-wide thing. From November of 1987 to July of 1988, um, there were probably well over 100 sightings with several hundred witnesses involved. The floodgates had opened. It seemed that everyone had a UFO story. I saw what I thought was a shooting star, 
and it went whew, like this and just stopped. And then all of a sudden, another one came whew, like this. The red light came in and it uh, pulsated for a while and then it turned uh, bright white. And there was this huge orange globe hanging there. It was about like four stories high and it was hovering over the water. I was walking and looked up and I saw a big shining green oval shining right through the cloud. It was very vivid color, very bright neon green. It was a, it was a very bright uh, red light, uh, most like a traffic light uh, up in the sky almost. Uh, all by itself and it just came in from nowhere. And another one came from another direction like that and they just kind of hovered. It terrified me because I, I was afraid to keep on walking but I didn't, there was nowhere I could go and nobody could hear me if anything was going to happen to me. Four orange balls just popped in with three balls on the top, big bright reddish orange balls and I thought, oh my god, what is that? My wife was driving me to the post office where I worked and she noticed something shoot in front of our car. And she said, Ken, did you see that? And I could only yell at him saying, look out of the window, look out the side window, there's something out there, look out there, there's a plane or a helicopter. It appeared like you could see through some layers of it, although it wasn't totally transparent, like, like a marble would be, okay? And, and inside there appeared to be some swirling gas or fluids. Around the center of it, there was one light that was chasing around, you know, like Christmas tree lights, and this object was just hovering. I wasn't really afraid, I, I couldn't use that term, just, just sheer amazement, because I just couldn't believe, you know, you can't believe your eyes. There's nothing. It's a rubbish. I spent seven years in the Air Force, I've seen many different aircraft. We're seeing something that we're obviously seeing, but we have no concept of what it is that we're seeing. The atmosphere in Gulf Breeze started to reach fever pitch with people desperate to see their own UFO. Residents started to congregate on the beaches at night and became known as the Sky Watchers. Shoot her up! We started going out on watches and uh, from there on it's just uh, been a wild and crazy ride of watching UFOs in the sky around here. There's two of them! There's three of them! Yeah. Did you see the white? Yeah. Did you see the white yeah. black spot in the middle with the ring all around it points of light all around? Look, 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 look! Look, 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 look! look. Come on over here and show us some more, Bubba. Mama! No, no, jump away! Oh, no. Come back, come back. That baby went in warp drive. They did strange things, uh, moved around strange motions in the sky. Sometimes they would fall and disappear. Sometimes they would stop and turn red. At times you could see the object revolving. Lolly! Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! What's going on up there? This is a mommy. Two of them! It's got something hanging out the side. Damn! Good Lord! What is that baby doing? And one of the things we were trying to do was to see if, if we could get some sort of an interaction uh, with the UFOs themselves. Two waves of UFOs, uh, bright cherry red lights appeared. We had this handheld uh, uh, 500,000 candle power light, and by flashing that light three times at the UFO, the UFO blinked back three times. Look, 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 look! Look, 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 look! It was very profound to have that interaction. So there's some, some intelligence on the other side of this thing that's aware of us and is responding to us. So what were the Sky Watchers seeing? They believed that they were UFOs. But was there another answer? Most people are, want to be uh, a part of the crowd or to be a part of uh, what's going on. 
and I think this uh, may have something to do with some people's experiences. Uh, there are some people on the periphery of the experience that will uh, feel like they have a need to be a part of what's actually happening. Right, the plane is going right toward it. The plane went right in front of it. If people really had seen something, could the answer be found closer to home? Gulf Breeze has one of the world's highest concentrations of air bases, which makes it almost impossible not to see an aircraft when you look up at the sky. A large number of people, perhaps even as much as 80% of the more people observe uh, craft in, in the area, are simply observing uh, misidentified objects such as uh, the planet Venus uh, uh, or a meteorite or simply airplanes uh, observed by an untrained eye. Uh, and we identify a lot of the reports uh, as being uh, aircraft. But ex-U.S. Air Force pilot Bland Pugh believes he has pictures which prove otherwise. I started out taking fast photography, if you will, using 1,000 millimeter film. All I was getting, no matter what I did, was a red light and or a red light with an orange center. I knew there had to be something else there, so the only thing that I could think of was to go to a time exposure. We noticed that, that there was some movement left to right, left to right. We could see that these oscillations were in a set pattern. Bland also photographed aeroplanes comparing their straight flight patterns with the erratic path of the UFOs. I spent almost five years in the military, I, I, in the Air Force. I've seen enough airplanes. I've been in enough airplanes. I was a pilot at one time. I, you know, I'm sorry, they're not airplanes. Inconclusive, perhaps. More intriguing are a set of pictures taken of a reported incident in January 1994. Three F-15 Eagle fighters were claimed to have approached an unidentified craft hovering over Santa Rosa Sound, Gulf Breeze. There are three jets, two high and one low, coming in towards this object. And it turns out that the photo shows the jet actually blocking part of the image of the UFO. Uh, this jet flew along and actually made a little bit of a turn around the thing, indicating the guy must have seen it. If the picture isn't faked, could there be a more down-to-earth explanation for the object in the sky? I am now convinced that some major contractors in the U.S. of A. are building vehicles that appear similar to some of the UFO sightings. Who's to say that it's not military? However, Gulf Breeze has a population of 30,000 people. Uh, I don't think that the military is going to use a populated area of this size to experiment. Uh, I just don't believe that. The military remained tight-lipped on the affair. Their only comment is that all investigations into UFOs ceased in 1969. Their silence has been fueled for the conspiracy theorists. Top of their list was an incident involving six soldiers from the 701st Army Intelligence Unit based in Augsburg, West Germany. Their job had been to decipher highly sensitive and top secret radio and satellite transmissions. A group of people who turned out to be military intelligence people who had just plain left their observation post in Germany and come to the United States. Uh, they were missing, missing in action for five days. The government didn't know where they were. No one knew why on July the 9th, 1990, the unit deserted, or where they'd gone, until one of them turned up in Gulf Breeze and was arrested by patrol officer Donald Stevens. 904-41402, first class We talked to this guy, interviewed him, and he just kept telling us, you know, you just don't know what you got. And finally, he gave in and told us that him and five other deserters from the Army had stolen some computer chips and some high classified documents involved in UFOs, documents that the government had and these guys were going to uh, just blow this whole thing open.
The rest of the deserters were rounded up at a nearby house. The question on everyone's lips was, what did they know? The NIA was involved, Naval Intelligence, CIA was involved, the FBI was involved, the Army so Intelligence, you, you know, forward. and we had, I bet you, at least 10 to 15 different federal agencies in our police department interviewing these people at the same time. An anonymous letter was sent to the Army and the media demanding the release of the soldiers. If not, documents linking the government with UFOs would be released. Four days later, the soldiers were freed and given an honorable discharge. That was kind of strange. I was in the military and you do something like desertion, you know, you would usually get a dishonorable discharge and uh, it was just hard to believe these guys got a uh, honorable discharge after what they had done. Conspiracy theories, thousands of sightings. Were they just a product of the imaginations of people brought up on Star Trek and E.T.? There has been the suggestion that many of the sightings are a result of people sort of, uh, I wouldn't say mass hysteria, but the, the uh, excitement of seeing things in the sky. I was riding my bicycle and a craft did come down and take me and um, they were doing surgery on my knees. Whether the stories are true or not, it certainly seems that many people in Gulf Breeze believe they've had a close encounter. This has led to the foundation of a most unlikely support group. I know that I fought them. I mean, I can remember fighting them, you know, because I remember kicking one and I remember punching another one. <laughs> so I know I fought them. I started this support group about three years ago for people who felt that they had been abducted by aliens uh, and taken aboard a craft and had medical procedures performed on them, then brought back. What I was was I was standing in my kitchen window and one of the the little fellows was outside the window, you know, eye high, even though he was really a short fellow, somehow he was eye to eye with me. And I'm counting on the blind and just screaming at him, go away, you can't come in. And all his reaction was, you know, just kind of thinking to me was, well, gee, I thought we had some kind of a relationship. He was, he was surprised that he thought I would ask them in. People can come together and talk with each other about their experiences. Uh, so many times if they talk to other people about it, people tell them that they're crazy. Maybe we're not all dealing with the same ETs, you know, maybe they're dealing. This helps them to talk with each other without fear of ridicule. The little short black ones took us to the ship and uh, one of the uh, beings came and put their hand on my forehead and the pain just totally went away. It was like a feeling of euphoria. It was the most wonderful feeling. The support group shows just how far UFO mania has snowballed in Gulf Breeze. But there's an even more startling barometer of the locals' belief that there is something out there. They're joining 5,000 people across America who have taken out insurance against alien abduction. If you find that difficult to believe, take a look at this. It's a policy form issued by the American UFO Abduction Insurance Company of Altamonte Springs, Florida. Motto, beam me up, I'm covered. For twenty dollars your relatives have the comfort of knowing that they will get ten million if you're carried off. And the only proof required is the signature of the abducting alien. Good night. Saturday Network. In the early 1980s, British Rail abandoned the so-called advanced passenger train because of technical difficulties that left some passengers feeling sick when it went round bends. Tips for success, second time around. Once a LARPing stock, the fruits of British technology are now only running on foreign tracks. But a Derby-based company is planning to build them again in Britain. On the same site, the first ones emerged. The advanced passenger train, as it was called, appeared in the early 1980s. 
but it was soon nicknamed the Queasy Rider. The problem shown by this cartoon was that it was the wrong kind of tilt. As the angle increased, the greater the motion sickness became, with uncomfortable results. In 1984, after spending £40 million trying to iron out the faults, British Rail pulled out. The one remaining APT is in a museum. It took such a long time in development that there was great uh, pressure to bring it into service before all the bugs had been ironed out. Consequently, when it came in in 1981, it uh, was a public relations disaster. So the British lost interest and European rail companies stepped in. They went on to perfect the mechanics, enabling tilting trains like the one on the left to take bends faster and in comfort. Unveiling the new British model today, the makers say this time the design is right. Instead of fully compensating uh, by tilting the train, the, the train now only partially compensates for the effect of cornering. That gives the impression to the, to the passenger that he is actually cornering. His eyes tell him he's cornering and therefore he feels comfortable. As with other examples of British innovation, it took non-British companies to perfect it. But now at least one company looks inclined to try again. Duncan Kennedy, BBC News. And the main news tonight, the there sprang up a new style of architecture. These red brick houses aren't really part of the common run of suburban development. That's because most of the building plots in this road were taken by the group of artists who made this area the center of a new aesthetic elite. Their homes used new materials and fostered new styles as part of the establishment of a new taste. And they demonstrate the developing status of the artist in high Victorian Britain. Part of the attraction of this area in the first place was that there already was, centered on Holland House, an aristocratic and intellectual circle. Holland House had been the ancestral home of the third Lord Holland, one of the leading Whig politicians that dominated Parliament in the early years of the century. The third and fourth Lords Holland and their wives maintained the house as a place where most of the political and intellectual leaders of the day, as well as members of the royal family, were lavishly entertained. The fourth Lord Holland also acted as a patron of the arts. He more or less adopted an unknown British artist whom he met in Italy in 1843. This was George Frederick Watts. The son of a piano tuner, Watts was a largely self-taught painter who came to live at Little Holland House, where he became a sort of resident attraction at the intellectual salons of Mrs. Toby Princep, a society hostess who had rented the old Dower House from the Hollands. The Hollands' extravagant lifestyle had forced them not only to let Little Holland House, but also to engage in extensive development of their estate in an attempt to increase their income. By the 1850s, the whole of the western edge of the park had been laid out as a suburb, with Addison Road as its main thoroughfare. Groups of smart new houses were built. These so-called cottages were completed as early as 1845. They're conventional three-bedroomed houses in London stock brick. Not large, but eminently respectable. Five years later, this terrace of larger, more showy villas was run up next door. They would be for families with a couple of living-in servants. Set back from the road, they are tricked out with a veneer of Tudor Gothic stucco. It's all fairly typical of middle-class, mid-Victorian suburbia. However, in the 1860s, development spread to the southern corner of Holland Park, where the first of the artists' houses was built in Holland Park Road for Valentine Cameron Princep, whose parents were renting Little Holland House. Val Princep's development as a painter was influenced by his parents' lodger, G.F. Watts, as well as by the Pre-Raphaelites, who were the leading modern painters in the 1850s. This painting, The Queen Was In Her Parlour, shows the contemporary taste for the medieval fantasy world of nursery rhymes. In 1879, Princep was commissioned to paint this, The Delhi Durbar, 
a major state occasion when the Indian princes gathered to hear Queen Victoria proclaimed Empress of India. The status such a commission conferred on the artist indicates the place Princep held in the social and artistic hierarchy. Val Princep's house has been much altered, but it was originally designed by Philip Webb, who just completed building the Red House at Bexley Heath for Princep's friend William Morris. Next door to Princep's house, there was built at the same time another, for the man who was to become the most prominent figure in this social and artistic circle, Frederick Leighton. His house was designed especially to his needs by his friend George Aitchison. The north side is dominated by the great window of the first floor studio, demonstrating its use as a workplace as well as a private dwelling. The north facing window gives an even light without hard shadows, essential for a professional painter. But this was always more than a painting room. It became the scene of Leighton's famous musical evenings, society gatherings held at the time of the Royal Academy exhibition. And Leighton filled it with fine art objects, among them casts of Michelangelo's Tondo and the Parthenon frieze. These indicate his taste for high art and for classicism. Significantly, you can just discern the frieze as the background he chose for this self-portrait. As a painter, Leighton is best known for his sumptuously elegant scenes from classical mythology such as this image of a festival called the Daphne Foria. The style of painting reveals his continental training, and it became the new taste in the last quarter of the century. Very different from the pre-Raphaelite works, like the Hireling Shepherd, that had been the new taste in the 1850s. Leighton was a friend of Holman Hunt, Millet and Rossetti, but preferred a more sumptuous style, as in The Noble Lady of Venice, which he painted in 1865, and which was later sold to Lord Armstrong for his collection at Cragside. The sums of money Leighton could command for his pictures in 1865 are indicated by his confidence in starting to build his house in that year, the first stage of which cost six times the price of the average house in nearby Addison Road. At one end of this grand studio is a narrow, hidden doorway, a separate entrance for the artist's models, revealing that in this Victorian studio they belonged to the servant class. The young Connie Gilchrist, who appears here as all of Daphne's attendant nymphs, was one of Leighton's favourite models, till at the age of 13 she began a career as a music hall dancer. Dorothy Dean, another favourite, here painted as Bianca, later became an actress, after Leighton had paid for her to have elocution lessons. In 1878, Leighton was elected president of the Royal Academy, and remained for the next 15 years a distinguished arbiter of taste. His house was already the focus of the new social and artistic set. The studio was the chief room on the first floor. Till 1877, there was only one other, Leighton's bedroom. Still, the first floor is approached by a sumptuous stairway, a feature that's common to most of the artists' houses in Melbury Road. The space is clearly designed more for elegance than use and is intended to provide a proper setting for the distinguished artist and his visitors. The exotic decor was all part of the new aesthetic which had helped establish Leighton's reputation. His prominent position in the art world 
attracted other artists to live in the same area. Immediately beyond his garden fence, this house was built for Marcus Stone. To the south, it has the appearance of a solid family home, but its north side is again dominated by large studio windows overlooking the newly built Melbury Road. In fact, the whole of the first floor is given over to the studio. Marcus Stone was a typical professional artist. He'd begun as an illustrator. His paintings were generally sentimental narrative scenes, such as this one, There is Always Another. And there's no doubt that as a painter he was financially successful. He was able to commission the architect, Richard Norman Shaw, to design his house in the newly fashionable Queen Anne style, with delicate rubbed brickwork and white painted wood. The house next door has been demolished and replaced by something more typical of Kensington in the mid-20th century. The site had been taken by G.F. Watts when Melbury Road was first developed and Little Holland House pulled down. He built this rambling mansion with two studios and a picture gallery. Watts had come to be revered as almost the founding father of this artist's colony. He'd become established as one of the most eminent and respected painters of his day. His many portraits included those of Cardinal Manning, and John Stuart Mill, as well as fellow artists like William Morris and the newly knighted Sir Frederick Leighton. The sculptor Hamo Thornycroft moved into Melbury Road at the same time, designing this house for himself. He made it picturesque with a variety of gables and tall chimneys. It was in fact built as a pair of semi-detached mansions with one half taken by Mr. and Mrs. Russell Barrington. She was an amateur painter, as well as the biographer of both Watts and Leighton. Thornycroft's half accommodated his whole family, including his parents. Both of them were established sculptors who'd already enjoyed royal patronage. In fact, Thomas Thornycroft had contributed the group Commerce to the Albert Memorial, using his son, Hamo, as a model for the figure of the young merchant. Hamo himself developed a different style that became known as the New Sculpture, in which he concentrated more on the subtlety of texture and delicacy of form. One of his first works to show this style was Warrior and Wounded Youth, with which he won the Royal Academy Gold Medal in 1875, the year before he moved into Melbury Road. His success later earned him many public commissions, including this memorial in Trinity College, Cambridge. At the other end of Melbury Road, from Hamo Thornycroft's house, is this handsome and spacious mansion built for another young artist, Luke Files. He paid over the odds for this prime corner site, investing even more than Leighton had ten years before in building on it. And his was the second house in this artist's colony to be designed by Norman Shaw. Certain details still display Luke Files' sense of self-confidence for when he began building, he was not even an associate of the Royal Academy. The north side, like the other houses designed specifically for painters, is dominated by its studio windows. Files' career had begun conventionally, illustrating Dickens' last novel, Edwin Drood. Subsequently, an illustration for the graphic became a successful Academy picture applicants and waiting admission to a casual ward. An affecting image of supposedly real life. By 1882, 
Viles was so successful that he was able to sell this painting, The Village Wedding, direct from his studio before it had even been exhibited, and for half the price he'd paid for his house. 700 visitors called to see it on sending in day, and at the peak of his profession, Files expected a thousand callers. But then Files was one of the new generation that in the Edwardian era was to be recognized as the established elite. Although Files had spent over the odds building his house, the one next door was probably the most expensive of those built in Melbury Road. This is Tower House, designed by the architect William Burgess for himself, but in a totally different idiom. Burgess was a long-standing friend of both Leighton, Watts and Holman Hunt. In the 1850s, he'd belonged with them to the Hogarth Club, a loose grouping of opponents of the Royal Academy. But in 1875, Burgess bought a plot in Melbury Road and designed his own private palace of art, which shows all his earlier ideals, true to the Gothic style that had been the leading taste back in the 1860s. Every part of his house was replete with medieval imagery. The bronze front door with its emblematic figures leads straight into a double-height hall. This has a richly decorated ceiling and the plaster walls are painted in imitation stone like the great hall of some castle of the Middle Ages. Every detail reveals a precise iconography. This identifies the door to the library. And the library itself is fitted up as a complete medieval chamber devised as a symbolic text. It's typical of Burgess's best work and is dominated by this great carved overmantel and the theme of language. The tower is the Tower of Babel, symbolizing all the languages of the world. In the doorway is the figure of Queen Grammar, sending forth the parts of speech. Significantly, her dress is painted with letters of the three alphabets, Roman, Greek, and Hebrew. The frieze of figures consists of noun, bearing the burden of the sentence preceded by two articles, V and A, acting as pages to a grand lady representing verb. And at the front of the sentence come the pronouns, blowing their own trumpets. Every detail of what seems to be an imaginary medieval street scene is pressed into the service of the iconography. Even the curve of the dog's tail is supposed to represent the question mark. The literary theme continues beneath, with an alphabet entwined in Gothic foliage. And here, Burge's taste for the whimsical comes out. The uneducated sculptor seems to have dropped his H. The cabinets, designed to hold this architect's library, are painted with an alphabet of scenes related to buildings. A is, of course, the architect, William Burgess himself, supervising the building of Tower House. The house was an instant hit in the art world. One client's wife spoke of it as a veritable shrine of brightness, joyousness and strength. Architecture students who visited it were surprised at its ultra-medievalism and massive construction. Even the heavy boarded ceiling is decorated with figures of scholars, theologians and lawgivers. The whole house is designed and built to extremely high standards. Yet the entire iconography is firmly rooted in the past. 
Here, the cult of the medieval is elevated to a private milieu, where Burgess and his friends might sup from crystal goblets and jeweled plates, surrounded by noble characters of myth and fantasy. The function of this dining room dictates different materials. The smooth marble and tiles of the walls are washable. So also is the painted zodiacal ceiling. This is made of sheets of enameled iron, almost the only really modern material used, but still decorated to fit with the medieval style of the house. The tiled frieze illustrates a fabled world that includes, amongst others, Robinson Crusoe with Man Friday, the Fairy Queen, and Sleeping Beauty, as well as St. George and the Dragon. It's a very English world in contrast to the one created by Frederick Leighton when he built this splendid extension to his house in 1878. Designed to display his collection of oriental tiles, the whole composition creates a fantastic space that transforms this corner of well-to-do suburbia into a version of Araby. The room was another creation of Leighton's friend, George Aitchison, and included several original Islamic items, such as the wooden gallery, or Zenana, brought back from Cairo. The collection of tiles was set off by new decorations, such as this mosaic frieze, decorated with motifs fashionable in the new aesthetic movement, and designed especially by Walter Crane. The whole place reveals a very different aspect of cultural consumption and progress of taste from William Morris's campaign of art for all. And the high degree of finish represents a different interest from the rough Gothic that Ruskin described in his push for the restoration of the working craftsman. But Leighton's elegant taste did become the dominant fashion of the day. You can hardly fail to be impressed by this extraordinary, dazzling display. Whether you like it or not seems to me irrelevant. Quite simply, it was the most striking part of the setting created for the leader of that little group of artists who became so firmly established as arbiters of taste. And they were arbiters not only for the relatively small coterie of friends and patrons, but also for the much wider circle of those who aspired to aesthetic acceptability. This taste was for the sumptuous, for the elegant, for a high degree of finish. But it seems to me that it was ultimately rooted in an escapist vision of oriental exoticism or the classical past. And yet, artists were never held in such high esteem as in the closing decades of the 19th century. Leighton himself was created Baron Stratton just the day before he died. He was the only British artist to have been ennobled. And so the ultimate accolade was bestowed on the taste of this little highbrow circle.
of which are due to our brethren. Davidson's appeal for moderation was also censored by the British Gazette, the government newspaper edited by Winston Churchill. The Archbishop of Canterbury had been effectively muzzled. There was a feeling that when the chips were down, that the church had not delivered the goods. And this is as true of Churchill in the 1920s as it was to be true later with Thatcher in the 1980s. The rejection of the church's right to intervene in the general strike came as a blow to the Christian socialist clergy of the ICF. In the face of openly declared class war, their fraternal ideals began to look unworldly and unachievable. Even their figurehead, Woodbine Willie, began to wonder if he had really achieved anything. But the Crusades continued. He would arrive with a programme sent out by headquarters and then he would find when he got to a particular place that they, either through public demand or because they thought there was an extra chance, they slipped in another engagement. Um, I think it's true to say that they had a willing workhorse and they took advantage of him. He was a start term without a doubt, yeah, and they worked him into the ground on it too. He was a frail man, he didn't have good health and they were happy to see him exhaust himself <laughs> spreading the message because he did, did it very effectively. In 1929, at a meeting in Liverpool, Studdett Kennedy caught pneumonia. I can remember then my mother setting off with our local doctor late at night and they drove through the night to Liverpool but arrived too late. He died before she arrived. The death of Woodbine Willie marked the end of an era. He epitomised both the ambition and the shortcomings of the church in the 20s, with his burning desire to create a better world and his utopian belief that political conflict could be avoided if everyone just got along together as Christians. But if in the polarised climate of the 1920s the middle way of Christian socialism was doomed to failure, there would come a time later when it would dominate the political landscape. Many of the public expected Woodbine Willie to be buried in Westminster Abbey, but the Dean refused on the grounds that he'd been a socialist. So the body was taken to Worcester, where thousands of ordinary people lined the streets to say goodbye to their hero. Among the mourners was Rhoda Mansell, the cemetery was absolutely full. Some of the old soldiers just remembered and loved him. They threw packets of wood bones in on top of his coffin. And the men wept, as well as the women. It was a very, very sad day. I wish he was here now. Since this program was made, war veteran Walter Williams has died. Canterbury Tales continues next Thursday at 9 o'clock.